Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hi, everybody. I'm here with distinguished professor and author John Weir, who has just produced a new collection that we're here to celebrate and promote called Your Nostalgia is Killing Me. And John has been kind enough to join us to talk about it. But before we begin, let me um, read a little introduction of John. This is his formal introduction. Uh, John Weir, winner of the Grace Paley Prize for Short Fiction for Your Nostalgia is Killing Me, congratulations. Oh, thanks. Is the author of two novels, The Irreversible Decline of Eddie Socket, winner of the 1989 uh, Lambda Literary Award for Gay Men's Debut Fiction, and What I Did Wrong. He's an associate professor of English at Queen Co Queens College CUNY, where he teaches in the MFA in Creative Writing and Literary Translation Program. That's an interesting field. In 1991, with members of ACT UP New York, uh, John interrupted Dan Rather's CBS News, uh, CBS Evening News, to protest government and media neglect of AIDS. He lives in Brooklyn, New York. Welcome, John. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you. Great to see you. Very happy to be here. One thing I want to note before we continue is that your first two novels are going to be released by Fordham University Press's in Fordham University Press's Relit series in the Empire State editions. So congratulations on that. That means oh. readers can get current copies? Are you going to write new introductions or um, are they just going to be re-released? Uh, I mean, those two books, the first one came out in 1989, um, the Eddie Socket, and the second one, What I Did Wrong, came out in 2006. And they, they've both fallen out of print. And this delightful guy named Richard Morrison, who works at Fordham University Press, kept asking me on Facebook. We became Facebook friends and he kept saying, do you want us to re-release your books? And I don't know, I'm perverse. I ignored it for like three years. And then I finally thought, you know, I'm not getting any younger. What the hell? So, um, so both those books are out with this series that he initiated, which is meant to focus on novels and uh, fiction that takes place in New York City. Um, so, oh. so it's it's the it's the it's the texts of both the the original texts of both books. They just you know reprinted them and repackaged them. So, and it just coincidentally the three books came out like all at once. So it seems like I've been writing furiously for the past two years, but that's not really the case. <laughs> well, speaking of Facebook, let's start with the dedication of this collection of short stories for 5,000 Facebook friends and 2932 followers at last count. That's a fabulous dedication and I feel personally affected because I know you through Facebook. Yeah. Um, we must have a mutual, mutual friends in New York, but I became aware of your posts and they're so smart and contemporary and analytically um, astute that I sent you a friend request and you were kind enough to accept it. And oh. that is how I learned about the publication of this collection. Huh, huh. So Facebook well, is working for me, in other words. It is, it is. I also have to add that I, I'm not really on TikTok, but I saw your TikTok reading. Um, oh yeah, I started doing some TikTok stuff. And then I think TikTok is, is mostly for like romance and sci-fi and, uh, young adult novels, and so I, I wasn't. I'm not quite sure. I'm reading. I'm reaching my target audience there, but but I've been posting things off and on to TikTok. Absolutely. Well, why not? Why not? Um, how long did it take you to assemble this collection? I'm sorry. What did you ask? 
How long did you did it take for you to assemble this collection? Oh, well, that's a really good question. I mean, it took both 30 years and 15 minutes, um, by which I mean that I, I had written a lot of those stories over maybe since about 1997. I had been writing all of those stories along the way, publishing them here and there. And at some point, I was sitting in my office at school, like on a cold night in February, and I saw that there was a, a contest that the Associated Writing Programs sponsored for the Grace Paley Prize. And I and the deadline was like 24 hours away. And I thought, huh, I probably have enough stories for a manuscript. So I kind of flung them all together and sent them off and more or less forgot about it. And then very much to my surprise, the following August, they contacted me and told me that they'd selected my manuscript. Um, so, so that was kind of thrilling. I mean, I had previously queried like 10 different agents. I don't currently have an agent um, and asked them if they would look at whatever I had and none of them got back to me. So I thought I'll go the contest route and see how that works and it worked out. So, so I'm suddenly a big fan of any of those writing contests that you can find in the back of poets and writers, they list that magazine, they list various contests you can enter um, month by month. And, um, you know, yay, so that worked out. And Red Hen Press is a, a lovely small press in Pasadena. And they partnered with the Associated Writing Pro Programs to publish whatever book they chose for that prize. Um, and so, and I've had a, a great experience with them. They're, re they're really nice people. And I kind of like small press, uh, working with a small press because they really get behind their books. Whereas like a giant mainstream press doesn't necessarily, unless, unless they know you're gonna sell a lot of copies for them, they don't necessarily back you up. So I think in some ways small presses are better. Well, Red Hen was lovely to me. It, it, you know, they sent me a copy of the book without a lot of hoo-ha or oh, PDF nice. file. I mean, they were really very generous about it. So, you know, I agree with you about small presses. They're um, certainly- Yeah, yeah small presses. Mm -hmm. um, why short stories? You're a novelist also. I, I, I Partly, I think just because I had all these stories and I wanted to have another book out in the world. The last book came out in 2006 and I was starting to feel like a big gay nobody, you know, <laughs> like um, it'd been so yeah. long. Since I, yeah, it's so long since I've published something. And and I just happened to have these stories available. Um, but also um, I think that even with the two novels, I think in terms of writing kind of in self-contained blocks and then like sewing them all together. Uh, with a novel, there's a there's an arc you have to think in terms of, whereas with independent stories, you don't have to. But but I, I like short stories. I, I read tons of them and I teach a lot of them because I teach in a creative writing program. And it's 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 really easier to work with a short story in one class than an entire novel. Um so so I've read tons of short stories and and uh and I guess I didn't realize until I started assembling them into one manuscript that it it was the same narrator from one story to the next. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm my main subject. <laughs> I'm my main topic of fiction, apparently. Um, and I and and I thought, oh, okay, there, there's a kind of progression here. So so they so they work as independent stories, but they can also feel like I think a kind of cohesive narrative over a period of decades, following this one guy from one part of his life to another. So that's why I'm calling them linked stories, I guess, because I think, I don't know, did it read novelishly to you or did they really seem very independent from each other, those stories? Um, but as we, since we're talking about it, why don't we pause and give the audience a sense of the writing and the story. And you've agreed to prepare a reading for us of about five minutes, maybe. Oh, okay, great. Good time, um, if you wouldn't mind. No, not at all. So I'll so I'll read from the story in which Charlotte Sheedy appears. It's called Scenes from a Marriage, and uh, it takes place in 1994, when the the speaker John uh, is living through the last couple of years of his friend David's life. David is also a writer. 
Um, Based on a historical figure I read in an interview, but you don't yes, mean. Yes, absolutely. Based on my friend David Feinberg, who was a novelist and a story writer. Uh, he wrote a book, a novel called 86th, and he died in 1994. And very calamitously, I've, I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've never known anyone to die like that. And sadly, I've known lots of people who died, but mm -hmm. David took it to a whole new level. And, um, and so I really didn't have to invent anything with him. I could just write what happened. He was already so theatrical. Um, and the events surrounding his last couple of weeks were, I don't know, the stuff of fiction. Um, so mm -hmm. to your point about the nonfiction fiction thing, um, I don't. I often feel like I don't really need to make things up because the stuff that happens in my real life feels fictional already. And so why invent when you have this wacky movie taking place in front of you with this very vivid central character? So, so, so it is, um, it's meant to feel like it's nonfiction, but, but it's, it's also not. I, there's stuff that I, you know, compressed and events that I merged together and the time sequence is different. And I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I, that I changed so that I wouldn't be able to call it strictly like a documentary nonfiction piece because I, I did manipulate things. Um, but, 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 I, but I kind of want you to have that. Uh, is, did this really happen? Is, you know, did he invent this? I, I uh, kind of was the effect I was going for. Here's I guess. What I found. That's very successful. Oh, okay. <laughs> You've succeeded admirably. Oh, uh, well, okay. So do you want me to read it then? Or, um, yes, please. Uh, okay, groovy. Uh, here it comes. It's called Scenes from My Mind. I'm reading off the screen, so um, we'll see how this goes. The second to the last time he gets out of the hospital, the last time being his death, my friend Dave goes on a farewell tour at Lake Cher. He's just published his new book, his third, his last. It's an, it's an account of the final year of his life, and it's impossible to read, partly because I'm in it, doing nothing to keep him alive, and and partly because he won't stop kidding about the worst thing that happens. My T-cell count is lower than my IQ, he says. If I were Dan Quayle, I'd be dead now. Two weeks before he dies, the publishing company sends him 30 copies of the book, and I load Dave and his book into a cab, and we drive around town, handing them out to every agent or editor or cute boy who ever rejected him. He's also trying to get someone to publish the diary he kept while he was in the hospital. It's a black mead composition notebook and it's an aborted novel, a toilet joke, an archive of AIDS obituaries from the New York Times for September and half of October 1994, a list of results of blood tests, CAT scans, MRIs, bone marrow tests, colonoscopies and bronchoscopies, a document of rage and a draft of top 10 lists. Top 10 most embarrassing public bowel movements. Top 10 cutest male nurses. And it's an autobiography in the form of a questionnaire. There are 500 questions which Dave has written in block letters in his careful third graders print. Number one, name with a blank line next to it. Number two, age. Number three, religious persuasion. Number four, number of lifetime sexual partners in thousands, circle one. And the options are zero to 10, 10 to 20, and a lady doesn't tell. Number five, life expectancy, and so on for pages. Of course, he supplied the answers. They're scribbled in his barely readable cursive script. His name is Legion. His age is, you should die like this. You'd know what aging is. For religious persuasion, he has written Liza. He doesn't answer the question about sexual partners. Next to life expectancy, he writes, I've got 10 minutes to live, but who's counting? Now I've got nine. We take this diary to several literary agents. David already has an agent, but he fired him because he brought ice cream to the hospital room. Ice cream, for God's sake. Ice cream is dairy. Dairy goes right through me. If I have lung cancer, would you bring me a pack of Virginia Slims? We visit Charlotte Sheedy, Audrey Lord's agent, also Ali Sheedy's mom. In the future, I won't work with anyone who hasn't ripped a lesbian and raised a movie star. Dave says when our cab pulls up to her building on Lower Broadway. 
And fuck you, he says, for no reason. He's always meanest in cabs. I'm getting money out of my pocket. I've been broke for my whole adult life, but I took a steady job just as Dave started getting sick. And for the first time in our friendship, I can pay for things. Lately, I'm paying all the time, which fine. He's always paid for me, bought lunch, taken me to Broadway shows, orchestra seats, shelled out a cash loan for a month's rent several times. I'm happy to pay. I can't keep him alive, but I can pay. He though hates the shift in power. Paying is, it, paying is his job, his privilege is his way of, it's his way he jokes of making people love him. Don't over tip, he screams to me. Jesus, get a receipt. Do you think you're a Ro Rockefeller? You're not, guess why? Guess why you're not a Rockefeller? Rockefellers have money because they don't tip and they save their receipts. We climb out of the cab. He weighs 97 pounds. So he walks slowly, his death walk, all bones. The skin at the back of his neck is creased and dry, sinewy, his hair is pin straight, slicked against his skull. One arm goes out to the side for balance, the other ends in a fist that clutches the waistband of his jeans. His pants are a sight gag, let go when they fall. He knows this and he'll drop them to shock you. And he leaves his zipper open to show his diapers. The pants and diapers are white, and so is his t-shirt, which is scrunched up over the Hickman catheter that's spliced to his chest above his right nipple. He's a little diapered man in a blue shroud, holding his pants up and moving stiffly and delicately across the sidewalk. He's 38 years old. Now we're pushing through the door to Charlotte Sheedy's office, and there's the surprised assistant at her guard post. She stands up then darts back, freaked out by what flew in. AIDS is good for something, a way to get access to anybody, push past office lackeys. Waving his hand, Dave says, we have an appointment. And we keep walking through the door to the inner sanctuary, straight to Charlotte Sheedy's desk. Dave sits in a wooden chair, sits slides. The chair is slippery or he is or both, or well, the problem is his coat, it's a sled, and he rides it down off the chair seat until he's sitting on his neck. Then he pulls himself up again and again. Such a little figure slipped quiet from its chair. That's Emily Dickinson, it's on my mind. Did I say it out loud? More poetry, my response to loss. Dave hates me because I can't help, or I can only a little bit and right now. Dying is a series of instant victories over nothing immediately fatal in preparation for complete loss. Will he not die if I find the right poem? If I can separate him from his coat? Let's pretend I can save him from his coat at least. Our lie agreed upon. I get him out of the thing which he drapes over the arm of his chair and sits still. Now he's a pair of shoulder blades in a t-shirt and above them a face. Huge head, shrunken body. His glasses are Dr. Eckelberg's, a billboard that stares at you. There's a narcissistic boon in watching David die because he lights on you with an urgency and directness that no one else has ever spent, his gaze. Sure, it indicts you, but you're hot and lit, a movie star in your key light. Floodlights on Charlotte Sheedy, who's been sitting behind her desk and watching calmly, waiting for the best moment to speak. Oh, Charlotte Sheedy, Dave says. I brought you my new book and also my newest book. I'm standing behind him. He's a film director and I'm his people. He raises his right hand signaling me and I step forward and hand Sheedy his two manuscripts, the new book and the hospital diary. I want you, he says, pausing to haul himself higher in his chair and to catch his breath and to grab his pants, which have not moved up the chair with the rest of him to represent me from now on. Charlotte Sheedy is spectacularly cool. She opens Dave's new book, the published one, congratulates him, thumbs through a few pages, mm -hmm. and then sets it aside with a palm flat on its cover, both stamping it with her approval and absorbing its contents through her fingertips in an apparent flash of superhuman appraisal. Then she takes up Dave's diary, which in her hands is, which in her hands is not, a, not a receptacle of rage and rubber hospital gloves and blue pills, but an ordinary book proposal. She's so smooth, I want her to be my agent too, possibly my mom. One page of the diary is entirely black and she stops there. 
Dave inked it solid with a magic marker one hospital afternoon, frowning while he told me that he hoped he didn't go to hell because he was tired of running into me. Even in hell, I'd have to buy you lunch. She stares at the page and says, I see. Then she closes the book, looks up. Our eyes meet over Dave's head. I'm trying to make my face say, sorry, sorry, sorry. Charlotte Sheedy is nicer than I am though. She doesn't collude with me in silent commentary about a man who is clearly at the end of his life. Instead, she looks at Dave. I'm not sure this is ready to be shown around, she says. Maybe she gets sick writers in her office all the time. Maybe all writers are 10 minutes from death. Please keep me in mind though, when you have something that's finished. Dave grins, showing all his teeth. Darling, I completely agree. He stands slowly and heads around her desk for a hug. They meet by her chair and do a quick theatrical cheek to cheek air kiss. And then we're listening to Dave breathe, his fierce breaths. It's an effort for him to stand up. I haven't dared to help him because there's nothing wrong. That's the story he's telling. He's not a man with just days to live. He's a potential client with a literary property he's shopping around. And what am I then? His people, his development girl, his chauffeur, his longtime companion, non-sexual, his stock boy, carding books, his pocket change, hailer of cabs, his walker, as if I were a woman in fur on the Upper East Side. Is George Hamilton accompanying Linda Bird Johnson, the president's daughter, to the Academy Awards, which Hamilton did in 1966 in white tie and a spray tan. Dave would get that reference. He loves anything tacky and obscure. He loves failed and minor stars. Three months ago, it would have made him laugh. Now though, he's gonna die and all I have is George Hamilton and a fake tan. Dave is breathing in Charlie Sheedy's office. We're all breathing. She breathes, I breathe, we listen to Dave breathe. We count the breaths, which come slowly with labor. Breath, pause, breath, pause. We stand there waiting for what's next. That's it. I hope that wasn't too John, long. Thank you. It was lovely. It was wonderful. I love that I story too. It was quite a thing to happen in real life, let me tell you. <laughs> oh, I bet. I left, out, I left out lots of stuff, but just, and oh, Charlie, she was so like, I would not have known how to respond in that moment, but she was just completely professional, but also kind and compassionate at, at the same time. She, she was pretty amazing. It's really an incredible story and part of an incredible collection. So let me ask you about the audience. You mentioned in the last story, called It Gets Worse, which is a wonderful, excruciating story about uh, high school. Uh, you mentioned that your audience there is uh, the parents of the bullies. Is that an accurate? I mean, it's a funny thing. I, I read that I had said that and I thought, huh, is that true? Um, but um, certainly, I mean, I know that kids had get bullied in high school for all kinds of reasons. Um, and I hope it doesn't, I hope it's not as misogynist and homophobic as it was when I was in high school. Although I'm guessing that depends on where you grew up and who your parents are and so forth. But, um, but I felt like uh, people who've been bullied like that have a, have a sense of what that feels like. And, and, and I mean, I'm gratified if they feel some catharsis and reading about it, although I don't know, maybe it would traumatize them. But but the 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 people that I've pretty much my whole adult life wanted to communicate with were the the people who bullied me and harassed me and flung homophobic slurs at me all day long. And 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 you know I, I often wonder like who are they as an, as adults and what are they doing now and do they ever reflect on that moment? Were they really aware they were doing it? You know, did they have a sense of their hostility, their violence, you know, their harassment? And, and you know, in a weird way, those are the people I've been trying to confront, I think, through my fiction for basically my whole adult life. It's kind of the same um, psychology, I think, by which when I teach a college class, I immediately focus on the person in the back row who seems the least likely to care about a single thing I have to say. I don't know, I always go for the, 
the person in, in the room who's the 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 least likely to be interested in anything about me. Um, I mean, that's not quite the same as being harassed by sixteen year olds, but but I but I don't I'm not sure that enough, in particular, straight people I think have a sense of their complicity in in making gender non-binary or 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 gay or queer teens feel like outcasts. Um, I feel like they're not safe walking into a classroom. And 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 you know, there's been a lot of talk about bullying and so forth, but but I don't know if there's enough focus on my complicity in that. You know, if people would ask themselves, what am I well, what did I do and what am I doing now that that allows this to happen. You know, even if you're not actively harassing someone, you might just by your, Sarah Schulman has written about this, about being a bystander to someone else being abused and mm -hmm. how, how the bystander has a complicity in that. And maybe in a way I'm trying to, to reach the bystanders and say, take a stand. You, you so wanna be, you to fit in and be liked by people and, and, uh, I, I, I mean, I know I was, you know, mean to various people at various points because they weren't cool or for whatever reason. So, so I, I also want to acknowledge my complicity in that in, you know, any of those stories. So, um, let's go back to the audience, though, like with the story that you just read. Uh -huh. Who's the audience for that, do you think? <sighs> well, Certainly, anyone who knew David Feinberg. <laughs> I remember the publication of '86. Yeah, and and his nonfiction book was called "Queer and Loathing," which uh, I don't think I've ever read. Although I mean, I read it while he was writing it, but I don't think I've read it since he died because he refers to me repeatedly. I mean, he writes similarly to what I'm doing with him. I guess he writes about scenes where he's sick or something, and and I'm in the room trying to help and failing to. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> he held me accountable in his own book. Um, so, and he had tons of fans and lots of lots of readers who really liked his writing. And so I'm happy to, in a way, give a shout out to David, e even though he doesn't always come across as the nicest guy. He was a very, very sweet guy, but also a very acerbic guy, sort of a mm -hmm. fun combo of the two, but all the sweetness went away when he got really sick, which you know, I can't imagine what would happen to me if I got that sick. I mean, you know, it was it was horrific how what he had to live through and mm -hmm. die from. But anyway, um, uh, I do want to document that period of time. I, I'm sure that you you, you were talking about reading Sarah Schulman's book. Um, there's there's a lot of literature and movies and and TV news reports now about the first. 15 years of the global AIDS crisis, like 1981 to 1996-ish. And, uh, and a, some, of it, some of it gets to the truth of it, but I think a lot of it treats it as kind of a theme park that we can visit and, and think, oh, it's so sad what happened to those people, but everything's fine now. And I wanted to, I wanted to give the most painful possible depiction of what it was like to live through that and how it's still affecting people you know, if you go through that kind of loss in your, tw I mean, at any point in your life, but, but especially like in your 20s and 30s, it's, it gives you a weird perspective to look at the rest of your life, to have watched all that death and, and all of the people who couldn't have cared less that it was happening and all the government neglect and the pharmaceutical companies. And it was very isolating and left people very much on their own to manage catastrophe it's as if, if it's as if with COVID, the, the, I mean, as bad as Trump was, at least he was saying the word COVID. Ronald Reagan didn't say the word AIDS until in the early in his second administration. So at least everyone knew COVID was happening to people, and people were talking about it online. And how do we manage this? And so there, so there was a sense of community happening around what is COVID and how is it affecting us. And um, with AIDS in that moment in New York City. It was just the people who were dying and, and everyone else was kind of oblivious. So I did want to represent, I did want to say, look what happened. Um, so so it, it's, it's both for people who lived through that and for people who 
want to know about it and have maybe gotten slightly sugar-coated versions of it from from TV news reports. Not that you can really sugarcoat it, but so, no, I, so both, I, both people. I think it's a really important project, and you do it beautifully. Oh, I mean, thank it's you. very pretty and real. Um, I mean, you lived in New Orleans during that period, yes? What, what was, no, what was in, your... uh, I was living in Boston in 81, what, as it was just being, you know, uh, the community was just forming. Right. And I remember vividly a gay pride march in 81 where um, the newly formed a ACT UP, I th well, ACT UP came up, came later, but uh -huh. you know, all these men were coalescing and showing strength and a lot of them appeared on the quilt afterwards. Right, right, right. So then I moved to Madison, Wisconsin, and then oh. I moved to New Orleans. And New Orleans, I mean, it, it, that whole period uh, certainly uh, marked everybody's lives really deeply. So right. I really yeah, yeah, yeah. appreciate you bringing it back because it's so important. Well, I, I went to see, um, there was a Broadway revival of Larry Kramer's The Normal Heart. Um, I don't know, maybe, I saw it in London in 80s. Oh, wow. Recently? Yeah. Well, no, I, it was so interesting. I saw it in 1986. And wow. then I went to a talk back afterwards. And it was like in England, they had were just learning about AIDS or something. It was the strangest. It was like a, a culture shock kind of thing, yeah. John. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. But I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no, no. I just, I saw the original Normal Heart, um, I guess in 86 at the, at the same time you did. And uh -huh. um, and I hadn't seen it or read it in. I didn't see the TV version. So then I went to the Broadway revival in 2011, maybe I'm thinking. I can't I can't remember exactly when it was, but but I was sitting in the audience with a bunch of people my age. I'm assuming there were lots of out of towners, and and I was watching. It felt like a home movie because <laughs> I had known a lot of the guys who were first involved in gay men's health crisis, whom Larry sort of made into composite characters and wrote about. So I'd known some of those guys and, you know, watched people die in that 1983, 1984 period. And, and, the, and the audience around me, I could sense them being like, how could this have happened? You know, who knew this happened? And I was like, where were you? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was all that was happening for me, but it's funny how something that huge and catastrophic can, can still stay a kind of secret to a lot of people. So, so I'm really wanting to explode that secrecy and, and, and make it more present for people. And another strength of the book is that the second part is called, I think, Survivors, Lone Survivors. Um, and you're able to suggest long-term survivors. You're right. able to suggest the impact that the irrevocable impact that it had on yeah. people um, who were there. Yeah, it doesn't go away. No. Um, I mean, ACT UP had a, um, ACT UP New York had a kind of reunion in 2012, 2013. Uh, it's some NYU building and everybody who'd been involved in ACT UP New York, I mean, a lot of people who'd been involved in ACT UP New York came together and, and talked about <clears throat> their feelings basically were like what they were feeling while all of that was happening because ACT UP was so focused on getting the government's attention, you know, intervention, street activism, and there, there kind of wasn't time for feelings in a weird way, or maybe it was a way also to distract yourself from, from the trauma you were experiencing because you could go lie down in the street and chant and get arrested and, and, and show up on the evening news and feel like you'd accomplished something. And, but all these people were still left with a kind of PTSD, I think, from watching so many people die. And, and that, was, that was part of the motivation behind that story was thinking about what it's like for people now in their 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s to have gone through this experience and, and still hold all these feelings about it. And you know what that has done to them, how that's shaped the rest of their lives and so forth. It's a really important book, John. I really thank you for writing it. Oh, well, thank you for reading it. Um, let's switch gears a little bit. What are your current projects? My next projects? Um, well, I have like three different books that I've been writing since the last century that <clears throat> every so often I 
open a file and look at it and think, oh, this isn't so bad. And then I write a page and then I put it away for another six months. But, but my immediate project is to write about my mother who shows up in two of the stories in the book. She died in 2018 and she was, um, I mean, I say in the book, I think she was a movie star without a movie to star in. I mean, she was the most theatrical, um, funny, smart, mean, capable, uh, like she was a cowboy on the one hand, but she's also like a Rita Hayworth beauty queen on the other hand. So she was this weird combo of like Henry Fonda and Rita Hayworth. And she, she wrote Bareback in the Woods and <laughs> her tennis shoes and she swore like a truck driver and, and a Taurus. So very forceful and very sure of herself. <laughs> the most certain person I've ever met, way more certain than I am. And I spent, um, she and my father, for some crazy reason, moved to a, a retirement community outside of Philadelphia where no one had ever been. They grew up, they lived in New Jersey for uh, 50 years, I think. And suddenly they were in this retirement community and my father promptly died. So my mother had eight years of living alone with just her dog. And so I, I spent, and then she had broke her hip and had a stroke. So really for the past five years of her life, the last five years, I spent pretty much every weekend with her and and she regaled me with all the stories about her childhood in Denver and and she she was like David Feinberg she was such a character that I could just sit there in her living room give her a glass of white wine and some cheese and she would start talking and I would just be pretending to like looking things up on the internet but I was actually transcribing every word she said and, and so I I have you know 80 pages of of my mother's monologues so I'm, um, so I'm, so I'm writing about her. It's my next project. I'm spending the summer in Denver, where she grew up, where I've really never been, and I'm trying to sort of find out stuff about her past, her childhood, and see what was myth and what was actual, and figure out a way to record that all on the page. She's so easy to write about because I have her voice in my head. So even talking about stuff that she would like, she, she died before COVID happened, but I have her voice in my head telling me all about COVID. Um, so I don't really have to, I can just take dictation basically. Oh, my mother's talking to me about COVID and I can start writing it down. So, but I really wanna introduce her to reality. And I feel a kind of obligation to record her story which I think she wanted me to do because she she fed me all her love letters <laughs> before before she died. She gave me this giant packet of all the love letters she'd written to all the, the guys she'd been in love with before she married my father. So there was a sort of a tacit admission that she was, was expecting me to use them, you know, after she died, of course, so she couldn't sue me. <laughs> <laughs> Is it going to be a memoir? Um, I haven't quite figured that out. I, I mean, I think it's going to be similar to some of the stuff in Your Nostalgia is Killing Me in that uh, I, I kind of wanted to feel like documentary, but at the same time, I don't want to feel obligated to write down things exactly as they happened. I mean, I, I want to be free to make stuff up or, or change names or compress time or, or move stuff around in time and space. So if, if it were a memoir, I, feel, I would feel way more like I had to say actually what happened instead of <clears throat> instead of um fictionalizing it in a way that that worked fictionally so so it, so it'll you know i mean i generally like to write stuff that feels like it's happening in front of you as you're reading it in a sort of documentary way um but but that doesn't mean that it's actually what happened so so I, so I, so i do deliberately want to ride that line and, and I think there's more room in publishing world lately for hybrid work or stuff that blurs those lines. I mean, I don't know. Have you found that? that, that... Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, speaking of time, we're getting to the end of our time. Oh, okay. Are there any last words you want to share with our audience? You know, buy my book. <laughs> read it. Buy it. <laughs> Makes sense to me. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Welcome to All Things LGBTQ Interview Show. Today, we're um, speaking with Rage Hezakia and Hezakia, and she is um, a well-known and quite published poet living amongst us in Vermont. And um, so 
we're going to talk a little bit about her work and um, who she is so people can get to know her. Um, you're living in Bennington, right? Um, I live just, I'm like, what direction from Bennington? I live one town over from, from oh, Bennington. That's, okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And you're originally from Massachusetts, I know, from Salem. Uh-huh. And um, how long have you been in Vermont? Um, my wife and I uh, moved out to Western Mass from the Boston area about four years ago, and we've been in Vermont for three. We were in, um, we were in North Adams before we just moved over the Vermont border, but we really like it here. And you're working in that area, Bennington, right? Could you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about what you do there? Yeah, um, so I work at Bennington College and I am um, the Associate Director of International and Academic Services. And um, I work to support first year and international students in their transition to Bennington and just kind of offer um, holistic support and visa and immigration support and, and all of that kind of stuff. And what kind of students go there? Is it is it a working class school, a commuter school? Is it a, um, you know, what kind of students do you encounter there? That's a great question. Um, so it's a it's a it's a private liberal arts arts college. It's really small. Um, we definitely have a um, we have a an organization on on campus called Flow, and that's for first income um, working class um first generation students um and so there's a large population of students that are that are in that bracket um it's about 20 percent international students about 20 percent students of color um students from from all over the world and and throughout the u.s but predominantly um you know the the coasts um a lot of a lot of new england folks and a lot of um, California and uh, Northwest folks. Sounds great. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your poetry and I'm going to read um, a little introduction and um, about your work and all the great awards you've gotten and it's very exciting. So uh, Rage is a New England based poet and educator who earned her MFA from Emerson College. She has received fellowships from Kava Khanum, McDowell, and the Ragdale Foundation, and is the recipient of the St. Patah Foundation's Emerging Artists Award Awards. Her poems have been anthologized, co-translated, and published internationally. And you have two books and one chapbook. So this is your second volume, and it's called Yearn. And it'll be coming out July 2022. Yep, it's um it's in pre-orders now, and then it'll be be out um in just a few months in July. Okay, and we'll we'll put up something telling people where they can pre-order your book. Um, yeah. And so Rage, in Rage. Is Hezekiah's impressive collection pulses with the deep emotional intelligence. This book is filled with space and beautiful verse that manages to explore the erotic, the familiar, and the mundane with stunning wisdom. From the masterful use of the centro to poems in the transition, in the tra traditions of Lucille Clifton and Denez Smith. This is a book that sings a necessary song. We are all richer in the world where yearn can exist to help us consider these questions and consent and contemplation. So that is a beautiful introduction to your work. Thank you. So your first chapbook, um, it must have been really exciting. Um, did you get it right when you graduated or, and could you tell us a little bit about uh, your first chapbook? Yeah, um, so, you know, I, I think 
publishing poetry is such a, it's like, it's such a strange journey. Um, so I finished my MFA at Emerson College in 2015. Um, and Stray Harbor, uh, my first full length collection and Unslakeable, which is a, a chapbook that's essentially an excerpt of Stray Harbor, um, were kind of published simultaneously. I think that um, made, I think Unslakeable came out like, you know, maybe like three months before Stray Harbor or something like that. Um, but both of those collections were essentially um, my MFA thesis. So I finished, I started writing those poems in 2012 um, and probably the last of them was written in, in 2016. And then the book came out in 2019. So there was a lot of a lot of space, a lot of uh, um, you know iterations of that book. It it took a it took a while for me to publish, and I and I think it's um, I don't know I th I think it's harder to publish your first collection. I've heard that it like you know publishing your first collection kind of creates space for for future books. So this new collection yearn. Um, got picked up really quickly, like within a few months of me submitting it. So it's um, it's really lovely because I feel very connected to the work. It still feels like um, what I'm writing right now. Whereas when I was, when I published Stray Harbor, I felt like I was reading from a book I had written, you know, five years ago. It felt very different from what I was working on when the book came out. And so the transition um, to what you're writing now reflects, of course, who you are now and you know what you've gone through and how you've established yourself in the world um do you how do you write do you get up in the morning and say okay i got an idea or do you just kind of spontaneously write and how, you know how do you do that yeah um it's it's all over the map i'm really grateful um you know i work on the academic calendar which means that there's there's a lot of space in, um, you know, what we call non-term time at Bennington, but uh, between semesters, essentially, uh, you know, for me to just have more space to invest in my work. Um, on a daily basis, I get up in the morning, I meditate, I pray, I make a cup of coffee, and I sit down at my desk, and a lot of times that space is... Um, taken up by like scheduling readings and submissions and kind of the more like administrative parts of being a poet. Um, but that's when the majority of my writing takes place too. Um, I actually had, I'm very fortunate in that Bennington College um, has one of Robert Frost's old house um, and uh, old houses <laughs> uh, and, I, I was able to spend most of the day there working on um, edits for my book, and that's incredible. Very generous, yeah, it's very, yeah. it's been so cool to be able to just you know sit in his life, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sit in his living room and work on my book. It's a tremendous privilege, so I feel really, really grateful. So I gather from this introduction that um, you have been influenced by. Uh, Lucille Clifton and Denez Smith, you feel mm -hmm. like you've, um, and Sento, do you use some of their work in conjunction with yours, like using their work, you know, words or maybe idea? Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? I don't think many people would be familiar with what that actually means. Yeah, um, so, so a Cento, it's one of my favorite forms to write. It feels like it's kind of cheating as far as writing um, forms and poetry because they're my understanding my interpretation of a cento is a poem that's comprised entirely of lines from other people's poems um, and so there are three centos in the book and um, I really love writing centos because it it kind of feels like um, I'm a knitter but it kind of feels like quilting to me it feels like I get to kind of take take pieces and and, and find the commonalities and the things that I'm drawn to in poems, um, you know, tend to be pretty, 
consistent. And so when I'm reading, I often write down um, lines of poems I really adore on index cards. And then I just have a bunch of index cards with lines on them and the author on the back. And I can kind of like move them around and create a poem and then know where all the lines are taken from. So that's, um, that's where, uh, that's how I've, how I've been able to write Chentos so far. And I'm, I'm grateful that um, it's a form that I've come to love in part because it feels like, you know, I get to use other people's work in an, in an ethical way. <laughs> But it must, it must be something that really moves you, right? I mean, it's got to be like, you know, some yeah. identification or something that really moves you to want to do that. Yeah. There, and it's um, an honor, I think, too, for the person you're writing, you know? Yeah, yeah. I um, a, a lot of the book um, deals with my um, my challenges with fertility and trying to get pregnant and um Ada Lamone wrote a book recently um called The Carrying where she kind of talked a lot about her own fertility journey and one of the lines that um that I borrowed for one of the centos that I wrote was um I am a hearth of spiders these days a nest of trying and I just was like so shaken by that. And it, and it felt so true to my own experience, like that, that my whole life was trying and how like, um, you know, just how bleak, like being a hearth of spiders. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that's so bleak. And it also feels yes. like, oh, like, <laughs> yeah. like yeah. so true and so there's something really beautiful for me about being able to appropriate that language and and fold it into the language of of other poets that I really admire and um and create new work from that I know it's 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 really um you know it's something that not everybody can pull off so congratulations oh, thank that. you <laughs> um and then I want I was reading some of your poetry and I came across my wife is always right. And I laughed, of course, because my wife is always right also. <laughs> um, <laughs> even when she isn't, but you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and this poem, it, it, the language is so sparse and so poignant. and so like, you know, like I, I read the last part and I thought, you know, you could have said, um eat their own but you use kin mm. and I, I just found that like wow mm. um just the use of language and the sparseness of the language is just beautiful thank so would you. you mind reading it for us sure thank you so much well, I, pulled, I pulled one poem out and not both of them let me just find it really quick And then I'll ask you to read another poem too. Beautiful. Um, my wife was right. My wife was right when she said the mice would burrow back into the deep bin, reaching my hand into the barrel's hovel, their nest skittered, cottoned in selvage. We tipped the tiny family into damp oak leaves on the lawn, and rid the bin of seed. I'd filled our feeders, beckoning goldfinches, black-capped chickadees, suet for the sap suckers. My wife worried they'd return. I dismissed her fears. Days later, black dust littering the cover, evidence of re-entry. Three starved bodies, huddled in the bottom, one faceless, consumed by her own kin. That's incredible yeah. to, you know, um, to express that kind of feeling. Um, 
would you read us another poem of your choice? And, and yeah. um, but first, before you do that, how did you come upon this idea? Is this something that sort of happened? Um, uh, my wife, the, uh, of that poem, my wife was right. Yeah. Did, is that oh, the, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it's, it's wild because I think living in Vermont, I've talked a lot with other poets about how, how where you live and where you spend your time just kind of like funnels itself into your poetry. Like it feels like, you know, by osmosis, um, there's chickadees and goldfinches and sapsuckers. And, you know, I have a poem right now with a Phoebe in it. I know like, you know, I've, I've had a, a workshop with um, Vivi Francis, who's another uh, Vermont poet, um, and she said, oh, poets love birds. Uh, <laughs> and I thought, yeah, like poets yeah. love birds. Um, but this book, um, Yearn, has multiple poems in it about mice because there are just, you know, living in, living in Vermont, I have a cat, like the interactions between the cat and mice, like oh. the inside, the outside, it's all in there. So that, yeah, that did, um, that did happen and there's lots of lots of other disturbing mice poems <laughs> taken from taken from real life in this, in this book as well <laughs> yeah. you know but it has so much you know besides i mean just as a venue for you know mm. the mice but it has so much more in it yeah uh, that is yeah yeah really Absolutely. touching thank you um, so do you want to read another poem for us sure yeah so you mentioned um Lucille Clifton um, and, and that um, blurb, which I'm so grateful for. Um, and Lucille Clifton has a poem um, called Poem to My Uterus. So this is, a, this is after Lucille Clifton and this is the last poem in the book. Poem to My Uterus after Lucille Clifton. Bright wanderer, homing station set for the gathering one tiny studded heartbeat. You shed bright blood each monthly turn. I thought I'd trained you, how feeble my attempts to control my body, my worry, and still you barren home, empty of anything resembling family. Each try frozen and fresh, familiar and foreign, Anonymous men I chose from glossy catalogs. This one plays basketball. This one plays piano. I bring them all to you, lay them bare, divide my thighs, hoping. But you, stubborn and polyped, pocked with fibroids, ever unwilling, I strive to line you with rich blood. One book says fresh pineapple. One says avocado. I eat whatever magic promises to make you take. Maybe I've ruined you with Accutane or decades of ortho tricycline. Pummeled the entry to your home with bleached water from public tubs, you worried carafe, sweet doomed hubble, show me what you need to make a life. Oh, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And on that note, is there anything else that you would like the audience to know? Your book is coming out in July. People can pre-order. Um, and where would they pre-order? Um, you can pre-order from my website, rachhezekiah.com, um, and I'll put the, the link to the pre-order in the, in the show notes as well. Um, and my website and my Facebook page also have a, a full list of events for the next few months. I'll be teaching workshops and touring around the tri-state area. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah, come come see me. I'm I will definitely. <laughs> and um, I hope you come to the Montpelier area or even Burlington. We can get to Burlington. Yeah, um, beautiful. So thank you so much for coming and joining us. And um, 
We'll see you soon. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.